In this biology tutorial, we'll look at human activity and its impact on the environment, especially with a focus on pollution. Uh, the first aim is to describe how our growing population affects our environment. Then we have to describe the use of living and non-living indicators of pollution. And then finally explain the process of eutrophication. Well, firstly, let me start by explaining this picture. Obviously, it's neither human nor is it a pollutant. So why have I got it here? Well, we're currently in the midst of a population crisis. Our population is growing exponentially. We'll look at what that means in a second. But the upshot of that means that we might have to be looking at different types of food sources. In fact, it's very possible that in your lifetime, something like this may become the staple food. You see, farming cattle and farming animals for meat is not very efficient. In fact, it has a major impact on our land and our atmosphere. And quite frankly, we're just going to run out of space to farm such large animals. Insects, however, offer almost the perfect solution. The only downside to eating insects is the fact that people have issues with eating insects. But if we can change people's perception, it could have a huge benefit to our environment. And it's important to note that many countries around the world do already consume uh, insects as part of their main diet. But understandably, if that freaks you out a little bit, let me at least explain why it's important to consider this. Now, personally, I think this is one of the most terrifying graphs in the world. It basically charts our human population growth. So on the x-axis, we can see time in years, and on the y-axis, we have the world population in billions, so 1 billion to 7 billion here. So you can see for about 8 centuries, our growth has been fairly slow and steady. But something clearly very important happened in the 1800s that led to a very rapid increase in our population. I think it's reasonable to assume that the Industrial Revolution, which happened in the 1800s, had a lot to do with our dramatic rise. This pattern does make sense. If you think about it, the more humans there are, the more they'll reproduce, and therefore it'll contribute even more to the population. This almost doubling effect of population is known as exponential growth. When you suddenly see a curve shoot upwards in a graph, that is a sign of exponential growth. And what that means is this rise is only going to get worse and worse and worse. But why is our growing population such a problem? But firstly, we must acknowledge why this growth has occurred. Um, it can be down to two major factors. Firstly, improvements in modern medicine. So we're better at fighting disease and stopping outbreaks of disease. Historically, disease had a massive effect on populations. The Black Plague, for example. And also our development of modern farming, meaning we can feed so many more mouths. And I think this is a bit analogous to building more roads to solve the traffic problem. You can build more roads which will temporarily solve the traffic problem, but then more cars will just end up using those roads, so you're ending up with a bigger problem than you started off with. So why is this population growth bad? Well, I'm going to start this off by reading a dramatic quote. A biologist called Jonas Salk once said, If all insects on Earth disappeared, within 50 years all life on Earth would end. However, if all human beings disappeared from the earth, within 50 years all forms of life would flourish. Now, whether there's enough evidence to support this claim, I think it's still important to consider the impact we have on the environment. So here's some problems of our growing population. Firstly, non-renewable energy resources such as coal, oil and gas are being used up. Because they form so slowly, we're using them up at a rate which will result in them being completely depleted. In other words, we will not be able to rely on them in the future. Also, burning fossil fuels releases harmful gases responsible for global warming and acid rain, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide, for example. The second factor isn't a nice one to consider, but a very important one. Basically, more humans, the more waste is being produced, as well as rubbish which is being thrown out. To give you an alarming fact related to this, it is estimated in the UK alone that 8 million nappies are thrown away into landfill sites every single day and this amounts to three billion nappies being thrown away every year and that translates to 10,000 tons of untreated sewage every year all from babies nappies so imagine if our human population doubled in the next 10 years how many more nappies would have to dispose of and finally no matter what we do us humans seem to love creating pollution and there'll be a lot more of it if we don't control our population growth so, more pollutants, for example, more phosphates, which you find in detergents or laundry detergents, more nitrates, which you find in fertilizer, more sulfur dioxide, which we get from burning coal, which contains sulfur. 
Sulfur dioxide, by the way, leads to acid rain. Nitrates, well, it causes eutrophication, and we'll look at that in more detail in a bit. And phosphates as well can cause plant growth, which may sound good, but actually it can have a very heavy impact on the environment, as you'll see in a bit. I think this may also help you understand why China have adopted a very, very dramatic form of legislation in the form of the one-child policy. In other words, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. Now, that may seem very extreme, but when you consider how massive China is in terms of population, it's quite important as well. But fear not, we can always recycle. However, everything in science has a good and bad side. But let's understand why recycling is important. Firstly, if we don't recycle, that means more of our waste gets thrown into landfill sites. Now, landfills are huge holes in the ground where we throw our rubbish. Obviously, we have a limited amount of space, so this space will run out. We need to find a better way of dealing with this waste. Also, waste can be toxic and actually poison local wildlife. So just imagine, I mean, if you want, just go and look in your kitchen bin right now and look what's in there. Just imagine all that stuff smelling and stinking away. Now imagine thousands of bin liners sitting in a hole in the ground. Now imagine it raining and all that horrible stuff that you've thrown away gets dissolved into the rainwater and falls a really, forms a really thick, sludgy, toxic substance which we call leachate, which sounds like a nice drink, but it's not. It's horrible and it will kill lots of organisms. I mean, can you imagine how horrible that would be? Finally, if we're not recycling, it means we need to extract and process new materials, which can be expensive and energy consuming. So that's why we recycle, but now let's look at what we recycle. So firstly, we recycle metals. Metals are extracted from rocks called ores, and they're in limited supply, so we will run out if we're not careful. Recycling means we can reuse the same metals again and again. Also, extracting these metals from mines often involves a lot of energy. For example, these metals, as you learn in chemistry, are normally chemically combined to other elements such as oxygen and we need to invest a lot of energy to break them apart from oxygen. That energy comes from burning fossil fuels. So recycling metals is important. Secondly we recycle paper. Paper is made from wood so recycling paper means less deforestation, less cutting down of trees and that also is good for climate change because trees take in carbon dioxide when they photosynthesize a very powerful greenhouse gas. Also, recycling of paper requires less energy than making it from scratch. So paper can go in our recycling box. Finally, plastics. Plastics are made from crude oil, which is a fossil fuel, which is non-renewable, so it's also in limited supply. It will run out someday. And it also decomposes very slowly. If we recycle plastics and we're not throwing them away into landfills to decompose very slowly, and we're not relying on crude oil again. So this all sounds great. But like with anything in science, there's always uh, a flip side to the argument. Firstly, if you uh, ever visit the Eden Project, you'll see this seven metre tall sculpture here, which is called Wee Man, which stands for Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment. Wee Man basically is made from the amount of electrical equipment that an average human will use in their lifetime. And when you look at this junkyard giant, it's quite an impressive sight to behold and also quite disturbing. I love the way they do the teeth. If you look at the teeth, they're made from computer mice. So the problems with recycling is it still uses energy to sort, to clean, to process. We still have a dependency on fossil fuels. Secondly, it's very time consuming. Sorting takes time. You can actually buy equipment to sort for you, but that equipment's very expensive. Recycled products can have lower quality. For example, recycled toilet paper is very uh, noticeably different or poorer in quality. And also some uh, materials can only be recycled a limited number of times. You can't just keep on recycling something because if the quality is reduced, then it just can't go on forever. So that's how our growing population affects our environment. So all this talk of pollution is actually quite disturbing. Um, but fear not, there are ways to find out how polluted your area is. Very simple ways. We can use living and non-living indicators. So let's start off with indicators of clean air. For this I just needed to go into my garden. I took two photos. So the first indicator species are lichens. Bit of science trivia for you. It was actually Beatrix Potter who was the author of Peter Rabbit, the children's book series, who actually proposed what lichens were. She was a mycologist, someone who's passionate about studying fungi. And she put it to the scientific community that lichens are in fact two species working together mutualistically in a symbiotic relationship those species being fungi and an algae, and she turned out to be completely right. 
So I'm sure you've seen these before, you find them growing on bark, on rocks and so on. And if you see them, it's a good sign. Lichens are very sensitive to sulphur dioxide in the atmosphere. They will not grow in high concentrations of sulphur dioxide. So this is an indicator of clean air. The second indicator species for clean air is black spot fungus. You can see these tiny spots on this leaf here. That's actually a fungus. And while it's not nice for the plant because it has an infection, it is good for our environment. It was a good indicator for a healthy environment. Black spot fungus is also very sensitive to sulfur dioxide levels. High concentrations will cause it to die. So lichens and black spot fungi are good indicators of clean air because they show where sulfur dioxide concentrations are low. You just have to learn the names. Next up are living indicators for clean water. Clean or fresh water has high concentrations of oxygen. Here you will find stonefly or mayfly larvae. Larvae is the non-adult form of an insect before, for example, they develop wings and so on. Also, you will find freshwater shrimp, an easy one to remember because you find them in fresh water. So stonefly larvae or mayfly larvae and freshwater shrimp are good indicators of clean water because they're found where oxygen levels are high. The next two uh, indicator species sound like uh, ingredients to Harry Potter potion, uh, sludge worms and blood worms, and they're found in polluted rivers where oxygen levels are low. You see, pollution is often broken down by microorganisms which use up oxygen in the waters, so oxygen levels are very low, and these organisms have adapted to surviving in low oxygen concentrations, so they don't have to compete as much to survive. For example, bloodworms are packed with haemoglobin, which is why they look red, so they can take as much of that little oxygen there is in the water. So bloodworms and sludgeworms are found where oxygen levels are low and indicate dirty, polluted water. But we don't always have to rely on living indicators, we can also rely on non-living indicators. For this we have satellites which can detect changes in sea surface temperature and also the amount of snow that covers our earth, which is a good indicator of climate change. We have automatic weather stations which are very sensitive at detecting subtle changes in atmospheric temperature. We have rainfall gauges which measure the amount of annual average rainfall. Again, indicators of climate change. We have meters that can read the levels of dissolved oxygen in the water, so we get an idea of how polluted the water is. And we can also use electronic meters which measure the levels of sulfur dioxide, which is linked to acid rain. So that's how we describe the use of living and non-living indicators of pollution. That's aim two done. So before I told you that nitrates, which are found in fertilisers and phosphates as well, can cause massive problems. Well, the problem I'm referring to is that of eutrophication. And this is an incredibly popular exam question to ask, which is usually worth four to six marks. So if there's anything I would really recommend you memorising from this uh, tutorial, it's this process. So eutrophication details how using excessive fertilizer on your crops leads to the death of aquatic life in local uh, water systems. So as you may have gathered by now, farmers are under a lot of pressure to feed our growing population. And one way they can meet those demands is by using fertilizer. So the main problem starts when farmers use excess fertilizer containing nitrates. Nitrates are mineral salts that plants use for growth. So it's very difficult to get the exact amount of nitrate exactly right for your plant. So the chances are you're going to use too much. So the farmer puts nitrates in the form of fertilizer onto their crops. So these nitrates are water soluble. So when it rains, the rainwater dissolves these nitrates. And then these nitrates basically run off into the local rivers and ponds and lakes, local water systems. So nitrates dissolve in rainwater and are transported to local water systems. Now plants can't get enough nitrates, they love nitrates for growth and there's plenty of plants in ponds and lakes in the form of algae. So these microscopic plants here, these green circles represent algae. If you've ever looked at a pond before and see that sort of green film on top of the pond, that is algae. So the introduction of nitrates into local rivers or water systems causes a phenomena known as algal bloom. This is when the number of algae grow significantly in water in a short space of time. So now you can see there's lots of algae covering the surface of the water. So the sunlight can't actually travel all the way through the water because it's getting blocked by these upper layers of dense algae. 
So what this means is the upper layers of algae can now photosynthesize or can continue photosynthesizing, but the lower levels can't, so as a result they die. So lower levels cannot photosynthesize, so die. So microbes start decomposing the algae and in that process they use up the oxygen in the water. So because there's now no oxygen in the water, all aquatic life dies. When water lacks oxygen in this way, we refer to it as a dead zone. And if you think this is just sort of make-believe stuff, uh, then you should visit the Gulf of Mexico, where they have a huge dead zone as a result of eutrophication. So there's a lot of information there, and it can be a bit overwhelming, so please rewind and look at what I've written down, because that's what you would need to write in an exam to get full marks. So we can quite easily investigate the effects of specific pollutants on plant growth. For this, you'll need a jar which you can seal, you get some cotton wool in there, and you put cress seeds on the cotton wool, the same number of cress seeds in each uh, experiment. So firstly, for control, so you can test the effects of the pollutant against something, we put water. The second one, for example, we could put nitrates as the pollutant, and finally, we could put sulfur dioxide solution on the cotton wool as the second pollutant. Now, all we have to do is leave it as seven days or so and come back and see what's happened. So one week later, we can see that the crests have grown as you'd expect in the water sample. The one which had nitrates soaked into it, the crest has grown longer and more. And in the one which had sulfur dioxide, we see no growth. But it's important to be quantitative, in other words, have numerical data about this. So we can measure the length of the individual crest stalks or stems, and then we can find the average length and do the same for the others. And that way we can meaningfully compare the results. And that is how you explain the process of eutrophication.